Hey, good morning, and thanks for being here. I'm starting a short series through uh, through Advent. It's Advent 2020, and I called this series "Waiting for the Lord" or "Waiting on the Lord," "Waiting for the Lord." And uh, we're just going to be talking about what it means to wait, because waiting is something we all have to do. And so I wanted to start off. I found a few uh, quotes about waiting, and uh, I'll share them right now, so you don't have to wait to hear them. So here's a, here's a number of quotes, and I wish you could see them. I'm sorry I don't have that technology. I'm not that good with that stuff, not that savvy. But this is a quote from E.V. Lucas. It says, I have noticed that the people who are late are often so much jollier than the people who have to wait for them. Agreed? Oh, I'm sorry I'm late. They come in kind of bubbly and fun. And we're like, yeah, this is not fun. Uh, Charles Stanley. Uh, great preacher of our time says our willingness to wait reveals the value we place on the object we're waiting for so our willingness to wait reveals the value we place on the object we're waiting for I think that's very true there is no great achievement that is not the result of patient working and waiting I agree with that it's a good one but the fact here's another one from Teresa of Avila this is a famous old uh, saint but the fact is, things always seem to come slowly when you are longing for them. Mm -hmm. And amen, and amen. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson said, How much of human life is lost in waiting? See, it would seem so at times, wouldn't it? So much of human life is lost in the waiting. Like, what am I accomplishing here? Here's a great one from um, Julia Child. Remember her? On TV, the famous cook said, The only time to eat diet food is while you're waiting for the steak to cook. I thought that was a good quote about waiting. <laughs> I like that one. It has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but it's fun. Um, here's one from Barbara Brown Taylor says, Our waiting is not nothing, it is something, a very big something, because people tend to be shaped by whatever it is they are waiting for. So that would be in direct, uh, you know contradiction with how much of human life is lost in waiting here's somebody saying that's where things it's a big something that's when we're shaped is in the waiting I think that's very wise I think both can be true both statements Oswald Chambers a great believer said one of the greatest strains in life is the strain of waiting for God I could just kinda that's a mic drop right I could leave that as the sermon you know, one of the greatest strains in life is the strain of waiting for God. Amen and amen. Here's one from one of my seminary professors. I remember he said this in one of his sermons. He said, God works slowly because he's very old. <laughs> and we know that's not why he works slowly, but it's fun to think about, isn't it? God's very old, and that's why he works so slowly. But it is saying, he was saying, you know, essentially, we've got to get used to the idea <laughs> that God often works what seems to us to be slowly. One last one for you here. See if you can figure out who wrote this. Waiting for the fish to bite, or waiting for wind to fly a kite, or waiting around for Friday night, or waiting perhaps for their Uncle Jake, or a pot to boil, or a better break, or a string of pearls, or a pair of pants, or a wig with curls, or another chance. Everyone is just waiting. Of course, that's, that's Dr. Seuss with his wisdom chiming in on what it means to wait. Uh, now waiting, like I said, is a big part of our culture, a big part of what it is to, to live, you know, our existence and uh, our experience of life. But everything we have in our culture, almost everything it would seem, is, is working hard to cut down our wait time. Uh, from little things like um, you don't have to wait through at, at the end of TV shows. I've noticed that we don't we don't have cable, but I've noticed at the end of TV shows anymore. It's probably been doing this for 20 years, but you used to have to watch the show and then there'd be the credits. Well, now they roll the credits while the show's still going, so you don't really have to wait an extra time after that. It's not, it's probably more ad time, but uh, anyway. So so anyway, always always looking to cut the waiting time. When I grew up, you go to Disneyland and you want to go on Space Mountain. How long did we wait? Two or three hours. Well, if you want to do Space Mountain, you're going to have to wait two or three hours. That's just the way it was. And then, then they came out with the Flex Pass. And you can go and you get your Flex Pass and it says, come back, you know, whatever time. You're there at 10. It says, come back at 1.30. You come back at 1.30 and you don't have to wait two or three hours in a line. You can go have lunch. You can go do other rides. And they worked that out so people don't have to wait so long. 
cuts down on that time. Uh, obviously, our technology is working hard to cut down waiting time. Everything's faster and faster all the time. Now we're getting these, uh, you know, the phones are moving to 5G. And we've had 5G in our home for about a year and a half or so. And I think it's working great. You know, it means we can use, uh, you know, Internet on a number of devices at the same time and we're not interfering with each other and it's, it's working great. But I can remember, as many of you can, remember having dial-up Internet. You know, we actually had to dial up, dial up the internet on your phone, so you couldn't use your phone. People couldn't call you during that time while you were on the internet. You know, be doo be doo be Dial up internet. And we used to have to do that, and then we'd wait for your pictures to load. You know, whatever page you were opening, it took forever to load. And we had that, you know, this was about 20 years ago had dial-up, um, even, even more recently than that. I think it was about 2006 or so, we bumped up to DSL. You know, like, hey, we're going to pay the extra whatever it was, and we're going to have DSL. And that was a huge difference, you know, to, to bump that up. And so we were moving along then. We could open up a web page, and it would open <laughs> within, the, you know, within the minute. It was great. And I can remember, it wasn't long after that, so we were kind of getting used to life with DSL. And we went back to see uh, my wife Katie's parents we visited, and her mom was always on uh, web TV. That's how that was her internet connection was web TV. I don't know if any of you have ever experienced web TV, but we experience web TV when we go visit, because we would go and she'd say, "Hey, I want to show you guys, you know, stuff she'd been looking at and some crafts and different things for for the kids that she was excited about. She wanted to show us, so she'd she'd be going through her web TV, and we'd stand there and watch, you know, like pixel by pixel these things load, these craft projects loading up. And we waited and we waited and we waited. And I, w I remember being so impatient about it, like, what is this web TV? And I like, you know, less than a year before, I'd had dial-up internet myself and was doing the same or similar kind of a thing. Now I couldn't stand to wait because I had DSL. And so in many ways, you know, the way our culture is going, the way technology is going, it's, it's teaching us not to wait. We're not learning, perhaps, the art of waiting uh, because we don't have to. And, that, and where that, you know, though that works great for a lot of things, and I'm glad to be the, you know, beneficiary or whatever of, of faster technology, certainly. It makes following Jesus all the more difficult because he often insists that we wait. That's why, you know, many of those quotes I shared already, um, you know, we can nod our heads and try and, you know, go, yeah, I get that. Because we're often waiting on the Lord and he does seem to move slowly. And it's not because he's old, it's because it's his way. We're going to talk about that this month as I go through the series. But... He's often insisting that we wait, and yet everything else around us is about not having to wait. You know, let's get it now. Let's get it fast. Scripture is, of course, filled with uh, stories of people having to wait and them expressing that. Um, and we might take some time with some of those next week. You'll just have to wait till then. But if you read through, say, the Psalms, you'll see often they're saying, How long, O Lord? That's like a common refrain throughout the Psalms. How long, O Lord? And you'll find it in a few of the prophets also. And you'll even find it in Revelation, which is the book you know, about the end of all things. And there's still people standing around saying, How long, O Lord? Uh, Revelation 6. And so, even then, people are still waiting <laughs> at the end. But waiting is something we can't avoid. It's not something we can... Um, we can't wait it out. You know, some things you can avoid by waiting them out. Well, you can't avoid waiting by waiting it out. You're still waiting. So we're stuck waiting in many things, certainly when it comes to our relationship with Jesus. There's going to be things that we have to wait for. It's just how it goes. And we, uh, many of us just know that. If you've been around, you know, we know that from experience. But I want to look at some of the reasons why as we go through this uh, short series here. And we're going to start in Isaiah 64. So if you have your Bible... Go ahead and get your Bible ready. Isaiah 64 ought to be almost smack uh, in the middle, basically, of, of most Bibles. You'll find it right about in the middle. Isaiah 64. And, uh, and take a look at some people who are waiting and try to understand why it was they were waiting and what they were waiting for. So if you've got Isaiah 64 ready to go, I will read it out loud, and hopefully you can follow along. If you need to pause me for a second while you get your Bible ready, that's the way to go uh, so you don't miss anything. But here's uh, Isaiah 64. I'm going to read the whole chapter here. Oh, that you would rend the heavens. That means, like, tear them apart, come through them. 
that you would come down, that the mountains might shake at your presence, as fire burns brushwood, as fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, that the nations may tremble at your presence. When you did awesome things for which we did not look, you came down, the mountains shook at your presence. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, nor has the eye seen any God besides you who acts for the one who waits for him. You meet him who rejoices and does righteousness, who remembers you in your ways. You are indeed angry, for we have sinned. In these ways we continue. And we need to be saved. Verse 6, But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is no one who calls on your name, who stirs himself up to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us, and have consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, you are our Father, and we are the clay, and you the potter, and all we are the work of your hand. Do not be furious, O Lord, nor remember iniquity forever. Indeed, please look, we are all your people. Your holy cities are a wilderness, Zion is a wilderness, Jerusalem a desolation. Our holy and beautiful temple, where our fathers praised you, is burned up with fire, and all our pleasant things are laid waste. Will you restrain yourself because of these things, O Lord? Will you hold your peace and afflict us very severely? There's this question at the end of it. And this is, uh, this is Isaiah writing, he's representing a whole bunch of people, the Israelites, who would at the time felt like God had, had abandoned them. And we're going to talk about why here as we go through, but you can find more of this kind of writing as you go through Isaiah and the other prophets also. They're all sharing, um, around the, writing around the same time. Same kind of stuff going on. But Israel had been warned um, over and over by these prophets. Jeremiah being one of them, right? He's a weeping prophet. Why? Because he was you know, kind of a gloomy guy. Well, not necessarily by nature, but because he was always having to give this warning, these messages of warning to people, and they didn't like hearing it. They didn't like Jeremiah. But these prophets came and they said, people, you need to stop. You know, the kings are corrupt, and the priests are even corrupt. And that means now the people have are lacking leadership, and so they're corrupt, and they're not following uh, the ways of the law. They were no longer doing that. In fact, the whole people as a whole, of course they were individuals, who were maintaining fellowship with the Lord, but but as a whole, as a nation, They'd forsaken the covenant that God had made with them. And I want to um, just briefly look at that in Deuteronomy 28. So if you've got your Bible again, head back to Deuteronomy 28. And I'm just going to look at a couple things briefly. But the covenant that God made with Israel um, came with either blesses or curses. And it all depended on what Israel did. You'll see the if statements. It's an if then. It's a conditional covenant. It says, Now it shall come to pass... If you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth, and all the blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country. And it continues on through Deuteronomy 28 to talk about if you, you, if you guys obey the law and follow the Lord your God, as Moses had instructed, then blessings on you and blessed you'll be and you'll have good health and the nations will crumble before you and you'll be safe in the land and it's just going to it's just all good stuff and we get to verse 15 through the rest of that chapter it says verse 15 but it shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the lord your god to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes which i command you today that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the country. And then it goes on to describe those curses, which are some of them the opposite of the blessings, and some of them even worse than that. It gets really bad as you read through that. Um, so I'm going to skip the list of curses, but it's it was ugly business. And so what happened is is God made good on His promise here. They didn't full obey the law, even after warning and warning and warning and warning, and God's mercy and mercy and mercy, and just uh, put He put up with them for hundreds and hundreds of years doing this stuff saving them you know all through the book of judges you read that right they they ditch god and then oh they're down and the philistines rule over them so he sends a judge and he rescues them and then yay we love yahweh again and then they fall down and they worship idols and there's just that pattern and even so with kings after david they were doing the same kind of thing and so they were cursed 
cursed in the city, cursed in the country is what happened. And God does this by allowing the Assyrians first, and then, you know, 150 or so years later, the Babylonians to invade. He lets the invaders in, and um, and they slaughter the people. They uh, capture and torture the rulers. Um, the temple was destroyed, burned in fire, as as Isaiah said there. And the healthy survivors were then carried off to Babylon. This is 586 B.C. under Nebuchadnezzar. Heard that name? Don't try to spell it. Healthy survivors are carried off to Babylon. That's where we find people like Daniel and Esther, and we read their stories, right? Well, their stories take place not in Israel, but often in Babylon. And and that's why, because the healthy people were carried off there, and then there were a few generations raised there. But the poor and sickly uh, that weren't slaughtered were left in Jerusalem to die. And that's where you find the prophet Jeremiah. I mentioned him earlier. You find Jeremiah. In fact, if you ever want to just sink down, you know, into gloom and darkness. <laughs> if you ever get into that mood for some reason, I don't know why. But but this will take you there. Lamentations, the book of Lamentations. It's a short book of the Bible. Uh, but it's basically Jeremiah's journal writing. He's basically writing a journal of his experience after this has happened, after Nebuchadnezzar has come through sacked the city, slaughtered everybody, left a few people there just to rot and die and starve. And Jeremiah is one of them sitting there in literal ashes looking at this mess that he knew was coming and he warned him about and now he's got to sit and watch it happen. Isn't that terrible when you when you know better and you tell people and then they don't they don't listen to you and then you gotta sit and watch and sometimes even participate in the consequences of that. And then and Jeremiah had to do that on a huge scale miserable situation and so Lamentations is a book that we all should read but but it helps to understand the setting that's the setting of Lamentations it's not just you know Jeremiah had a bad day or um, or anybody had a bad day it's written by Jeremiah and this is when he wrote it after this destruction came so God had left the building if you will and left Israel to the to the invaders and the invading forces and these curses came upon them and the worst part was, is that they brought it on themselves, and guys like Jeremiah knew this. It took a while for the people to, that were left to, to fathom that and to get that. And you see that in Daniel. Daniel writes about that too. But um, God had warned them, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. And then eventually it happened when they broke covenant. And uh, Ezekiel, another one of the prophets of that time, remembered it this way. Here's something he said in uh, 22, 29 of, of Ezekiel. So the people of the land have practiced extortion, and committed robbery. They have oppressed the poor and needy and have exploited the foreign resident without justice. Now I encourage you to look that verse up and read through that again. Uh, Ezekiel 22 verse 29. It talks about oppressing the poor and needy, exploiting the foreign resident without justice. And it's easy to look back as, as we're doing today and look back at Israel and say, oh boy, those guys were messed up. Boy, they broke covenant. Boy, they were getting it wrong and weren't they a real mess. It's a lot harder to take those same words and consider them for our own nation. You know, most of you are likely watching this um, in the U.S. And so, certainly in the U.S., we can look at that and say, okay, and we need to look at that and say, okay, how are we doing with treating the poor and needy? How are we doing with treating the foreign, you know, the foreign residents? Are we treating people with justice? Um... You know, it's, it's, it's always important for people to take a look at that. It's easy to get excited about certain issues and then ignore others, especially when, where it's a nation, it becomes political. And so to, to look at some issues that are important and say, hey, we need to really pay attention to this, and so I'm going to vote this way. And in doing so, oftentimes, because we, you know, for whatever reason, feel we have to choose a party, you know, we go, okay, well, I'm going to take, you know, this issue I'm all for, and we got to get behind this. And in so doing... Or for that camp and miss the other camp that is, you know, and the issues that we also need to pay attention there. Because they're not all wrong, in my opinion. Either camp can't be all wrong or all right. And so some of these things, though, that we need to take care of can be found in either, either um, you know, camp when we talk about Republicans or Democrats politically. So we've got to look at, are we taking care, care of the poor and needy? Uh, these are the things that weigh on me, you know, when I vote, say. It's not necessarily just for a person, but 
for, you know, what are they about? How do they treat the poor and needy? What are their policies there? And, and you know, how do they treat foreign, foreign residents, you know, people who've come in? How do we treat them? And how, how, do we, how do we handle that? So I think these words still speak to us and things we still need to consider today. You know, we'll be looking at this, I believe, in First Peter in the, in the next year. We're talking about, you know, judgment begins, you know, in the house of the Lord. And so we need to consider these things first. But um, this is, again, how Isaiah finished up Isaiah 64. I want to read just, again, what I've described and how Isaiah wrote about it. He said, Your holy cities are a wilderness. Zion is a wilderness. Jerusalem a desolation. So the Babylonians had come in, wiped everybody out, and then just walked away. Sorry, my phone's going off there. Verse 11, Our holy and beautiful temple where our fathers praised you is burned up with fire, and all our pleasant things are laid waste. So, that, so all that splendor that Solomon had put together with the temple burned with fire. Will you restrain yourself because of these things, O Lord? Will you hold your peace and afflict us very severely? So these are the miserable circumstances under which Isaiah 64 was written. This is what had happened, and now Isaiah is reflecting on it, going, Oh, boy, um, you know, we brought this destruction on ourselves. God had warned us about it. And then he hands us over, as, as he told us he would, you know, as he told us what would happen. He hands us over. In this case, it hands us over to the Babylonians, to our enemies, um, who were merciless people. And as Isaiah wrote in verse 7, he said, You have hidden your face from us. And that's, that's how the Bible often refers to when God uh, delivers judgment on people. It's not that God's up there with lightning bolts or whatever it is, or sending the Babylonians. It's that he's, he's often holding back, say, the Babylonians and protecting his people. And then he says, I can't do this anymore. And he, you know, doesn't literally, but in, a, but in this uh, poetic sense, he turns his face away. And now he's not, he's not going to watch. He's not going to protect them anymore. And so the invaders who want to invade anyway, because that's what they do, they do what they're going to do there. So, so here they are left wondering, is God going to ever care for us again? Is he going to pick up the pieces for us? Or has he abandoned us forever? Are we doomed now because we've broken covenant and it's just over? Is he going to stay angry forever? That's another refrain you see throughout the Psalms and throughout the prophets. Will you stay angry forever? Um, will we ever get it back? Will we ever get the temple back, the land back, the city back? You know, is this ever going to happen? Uh, history, we know, says yes. But these are people writing at a time when they don't know yet. They haven't experienced a yes yet. They're just... You know, they've got family members that they watch be slaughtered and raped and destroyed and carried off and all these awful things happen. And most of them are now sitting in a foreign land being given new names and, and they're slaves and all this kind of stuff. And so the Old Testament is filled with people asking these questions. How long, O oh Lord, before we, you know, are, will you stay angry with us forever? Is there any hope for us after this, after we've blown it? So in the meantime now, they're just, they were just having to sit and wait there, like I said, in Babylon, waiting to see what's going to happen. They are, or were, a weak, oppressed people, right? They, they have only the rights that the Babylonians would give them. But um, they're, you know, they're all slaves. They're starting fresh. They, didn't, they weren't able to take their wealth with them. So they're a weak and oppressed people, slaves in a foreign land. And this um, should start to sound familiar. If you know your Old Testament, and as it, as it sounded familiar, familiar to them too, it's like, we've already been through this, our people, in Egypt. And yet here we are again, enslaved. And so they were waiting to see if God would, would pull a similar thing as he did with Moses and the plagues and the rescuing the people. And they're waiting for that kind of a moment. But will it happen this time because we've blown it? And is God that good that he would still take care of a people who have blown it? Um, yes, he does. And many of you can amen that right now. Amen to your screen. If you've witnessed God be good to you and given you a second chance at something when you know you don't deserve it, when you've blown it, and you could very well be asking, will you ever be happy with me again, Lord? Will you ever favor me again? And then you see, yes, he will. Yes, he does. He's really good. So all these people could do, though, is wait and, and wait to see what's going to happen here in Babylon, in Jeremiah in Jerusalem. What's going to happen here? Um, I can't imagine what it was for them, these guys to wait, uh, or for, the, for them, the people waiting 400 years in slavery in Egypt. We had people in our own nation waiting 
in, in slavery, waiting to be freed. Can't imagine that kind of a wait. Um, but that's what happens, you know, when we, in our relationship with God. The rule is, okay, here's the rule when it comes to, to God. Here's what we can count on. You can write this down. You can count on this from God. Sometimes he will act very quickly. And sometimes he will make you wait. Okay? I hope that helps. Because, I mean, you know, sometimes, sometimes that's exactly how it needs to work is quickly. And God knows that, and we hope for that, and that's, that's the right thing. And sometimes it, you have to wait, and that's the right thing. Um, sometimes God um, is rewarding faith by, by acting quickly. So sometimes we express a prayer of faith, and he says, yep, I'm going to answer that one right here, right now. And sometimes we're expressing a, fair, a prayer of faith for years, and some of you decades, right? Decades you've been praying by faith the same thing for the same person or the same circumstance. And, uh, and you wait. And, you, and you, maybe you're wondering, boy, am I not praying with enough faith? Would he have acted sooner? And there's so many variables in that that, that I don't think most times it has to do with our lack of faith. I think most times it has to do with God's priorities and what he, what he sees as is most important and what needs to happen. I can't fathom. Here's something that, that comes up when we talk about why do we have to wait for God sometimes? Why, why does he not just act? Why won't he just give me the, or give us what the thing is and, and let's get on with it? There's so many variables in that, so many things that it could be. And, I, and as I think about this, I can't imagine, uh, if you will, what, what God shows up to, what, what God's desk looks like on a Monday morning, say. He shows up to work and his desk, right, is just going to be covered in things he's got to sort out. Now he's God, and he doesn't have trouble doing that. But all the same, sometimes I think we're waiting because there are literally, or at least, you know, it's a, it's a slight exaggeration, but could be as many as a thousand things that need to be put in place first before he can answer that in a way that's that's just, in a way that's right, in a way that's holy, in a way, you know. You, you pray for whatever it is. Hey, Lord, can I, you know, whatever the thing is. And he says, well, first, you know, he doesn't tell us this, but first he's like, I've got to deal with this, and first you need to understand that, and then first we've got to work this out, and then that guy in India has to make this move and do that in order for the thing over here to happen, and then it rolls down to, the, to you, and then, yeah, you know, 10 years from now, the answer will be yes. So oftentimes it's just, I mean, God is working out all these things that have to be, just as the people waited for Messiah. Like, you know, in this time, as they're, again, sitting in the ashes waiting, will, will Messiah ever come? Is there any hope for this nation ever again? Will God ever visit us again? Does, you know, yes, yes, I'm coming. I'm sending my Holy One, my Holy Servant. And so they waited and they waited and they waited. And God was waiting for things to line up as he's sorting things out. Yep, this has to be there and this guy has to be in this place and this power has to, has to be. And the Romans, you know going to take over the empire, and we're going to have this in place, and that in place, and Herod's in place, and the, you know, the wise men are in place, and, and Mary and Joseph, all these things are going to have to line up, and we're going to wait for that to happen. It can't just happen today. So, we wait, and we wait, and we wait. At the same time, though, understand, too, I'm not saying that God won't and doesn't act very quickly. He certainly does. Plenty of times, and you can amen that, many of us know, we prayed for things. My wife prays for these things like, God, help me find my keys. I don't think to ask God to help me find my keys. I'm just like, what am I doing without my keys? This is ridiculous. I always have my keys. That's me. There are other things I need to be praying for. Um, but she will lose her keys and then pray. And then God will show her where her keys are. And we'd already, you know, it's the kinds of things where we'd already look there. And, you know, we, we, we joke, but, but I, think that, I think it's true. He sends, you know, these key angels, you know, to, to come and, and rescue us so many times. And sometimes it's just fast and God is working very quickly. And there are other times we're praying for stuff and it's not today and it's not tomorrow and it's not a year from now. And 10 years down the road, we're still waiting and praying by faith. And sometimes that's to grow our faith, right? 
So I'll have you raise your virtual hand. I can't see you, but I'll trust that you're raising your hand if you're currently waiting for the Lord to act on something. Now, everybody's hand ought to go up if you're a follower of Jesus. Then we're all waiting for God to act on something. It could be a personal thing. It could be for a loved one. Waiting for health for a loved one, salvation for a loved one, waiting for a prodigal to return. Uh, things for our nation, as I talked about our nation earlier. Uh, things for justice, that we're waiting for some kind of restoration. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, next week. We're all waiting right now for this COVID business to be over. This is, again, if you're watching this in the future, this is uh, 2020, and you probably heard about 2020 in your history books. And it's like, what, is, what happened that year? Well, it was this crazy year, and we got this, this flu, that, this deadly flu that came, came around. And uh, places were shutting down and locked down, nations on lockdown, and everybody wearing masks. And it was this crazy time, and we're waiting still for this to be over. We're waiting for a vaccine, and so that people get vaccinated, and we kind of like the flu, and then hope that, you know, those who want to be kept safe from it can be, and those who don't really give a rip if they get sick or not, well, they they're on their own but they won't affect those who don't want to get sick so we're waiting around for that everybody's waiting around for that to happen um, as believers we're all waiting for Jesus to return everybody for 2,000 years as a believer has been waiting for that one so so there's lots of waiting things that we have in common but we're all waiting for God to do something somewhere for some reason so what I want to encourage you to do is take a, a pen and paper if you will or, or write on your phone. I often take notes on my phone because it's, it's just always with me. I don't always have a piece of paper with me. It's going to look like a mess after a few days. But, but I want you to write something down. I'm going to encourage you to do that. This is, this is application and this is very practical, I think, just, just as a means of keeping track of stuff. Um, as you're looking for the paper, I'll keep yabbling. Yabbling. I'll keep talking. But, but the, oftentimes we'll pray for things, and, but, and sometimes it is for a long time, but we haven't necessarily tracked you know, how long we've been praying for that. Or sometimes we pray for things, and he answers those things, and, and we're grateful, but we, we also uh, can easily lose sight of, of tracking those things. How long did, did God work there? You know? What was happening? And then um, I think we lose an opportunity to worship in that. And so I want to encourage you to write something down here so that you can go back to it and and see what God is doing there and uh, and praise him for when he acts and then trust him for when you're waiting if you're still waiting but what I want you to write down is uh, or type it in somewhere uh, something you're waiting on God to do and so we've each got many things we're probably waiting on God to do um, like I said it could be the return of a prodigal in the family a loved one that you're waiting to come back you know, they've, they've wandered off. You raised them and then they've wandered off and gone wild and waiting for them to come back. Um, salvation of a loved one. Uh, justice in, in a particular situation. Waiting for, for, for things to be made right. Um, or, think, or, or for someone or yourself to be vindicated. You know, when you've been wronged and uh, or wrongly accused and you're waiting for that to be righted. You know, uh, waiting for healing for yourself or for somebody else you know. Waiting for clarity about what to do next. That's a, that's a common one. So when I'm waiting on, what Lord, what would you have me do next? What's the next step for me? What's the next thing for me? And waiting for, uh, for understanding on that. But we've all got something we could write down. So I want to encourage you to take a minute to write that down. Um, it doesn't have to be the most important thing you're waiting for, or you know, you don't have to make it. It's just something you're waiting on the Lord to do. And just write it down, you know, just kind of scribble it out. And then what I'm wanting people to do is, uh, you know, come back to it. Look at it throughout the week. So that's why, you know, if it's on your phone, put it as your wallpaper maybe, or something where you're going to see it often. Put it on your fridge, put it on the, um, tape it to, you know, a mirror in the bathroom, or whatever you need to do so that you're seeing it often and reflecting on it often and praying for it often and uh, and then waiting to see what God will do. And for some of you, um, depending on what it is, 
right? You may see an answer very quickly. And be encouraged in that. You know, God is listening to your prayers and he's concerned for you. And some of us are going to be waiting for the thing that we write down. Some, you know, you may have already written something you've been waiting for for months or years, and you, and you know that you, you're in it for the long haul, and, and, but maybe it's coming to a close. Or maybe you'll keep waiting, and it's just hard to know on that. But I think this is important for us to track that and to keep that in mind. And to keep in mind that as you wait for that, that God has, has reasons why you're waiting for for that and it's not simply because he's not listening or he doesn't care or because you haven't prayed with enough faith you know that you got to conjure something up within yourself to to then convince him to act he said often time you know certainly for me god has bigger fish to fry i mean he's got he's got other things to do than to than to grant me if you will my wishes you know god's not burger king you know have it have it your way he's like we need, you know, the things that need to happen. I'd be happy to help on this one. You know, many of the things we're praying for and waiting for are according to his will. We already know this is the kind of thing you're all about, right? He's like, yeah, but we, we got to take care of some other things first. And so, um, so he may be responding quickly to your, to your thing. You may have to wait, maybe building up faith, or now may be the time. Um, maybe waiting because there's, you know, a thousand other things that need to line up first, but we got to trust him with that process. Learn to trust him with the process because we can't escape that process. We can't escape waiting on the Lord. It's not something we we get to go, well, I've I found a, you know, a magical prayer that that makes God answer things faster. You know. Sorry, but that's not that's not the way he works. Oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes he has us wait for things. And he has his good reasons for that. Um but we, but we can remember, you know, he made good on his promise to, to send Messiah, right? Which is what we're going to be celebrating for the next month or so. You're, I'm saying this before Thanksgiving. This is the day before Thanksgiving. You'll be listening to this after Thanksgiving. So it's officially Christmas season where you are. I'm saying it a day early, but that's okay. I've got to think about these things earlier than the rest of us. Preparing for Advent, you know, it's about the coming of Christ. And we're going to be... Um, celebrating God and you know God coming through on his promise to these people who were felt forsaken and rightly so because they'd blown it and yet he says no I'm going to send um, a savior to you and we're going to celebrate that for the next month God made good on that promise he's promised to return for us and to and to make things right to establish a right order for eternity um, justice we call it judgment, but he, he, you know he's going to establish a, the will, things will be just and righted, um, and he's promised that, and he will make good on that. The one who made good on that last promise is going to is going to make good on this one too. He said he'd come and save, and he did, and he said he'll come back. He will. We can trust him for that. In the meantime, we learn to wait. So I encourage you, um, you know, to, to engage in this process. We'll we'll talk about it more. Next week, like I said, you'll have to wait for that one. But uh, but what it is to wait on the Lord and the and the benefits of that. Uh, God is so good, I think, to have us wait. Just as he's so good to, to do things quickly sometimes, he's also so good to have us wait. And so we've got to learn to trust him with the process. So uh, put that piece of paper or, or, or you know, go back to your phone uh, often. Uh, this week and in the coming weeks and just see what God is doing there and see you know whether or not he's answering and also how he might be working in your heart and in in means of understanding what he's doing and and in your relationship with him as you wait for him so bless you as you do that I trust you had a great Thanksgiving it's different this year we didn't get to go home uh, I didn't get to be with my folks for the first year ever and so it's uh, different for us, but I pray that, that God will bless you all the same and bless you through uh, this COVID thing and bless you through the Christmas season. We can celebrate Advent no matter how much plague is going through the land. We can still celebrate uh, the coming of Christ and look forward to his return. Amen. So God bless you this week, and I'll uh, plan to see you next time around.